Now, as we move into this portion, this is where we begin to break down our levels of organization. And we started our first level at the chemical level with atoms. This is really our smallest unit of substance. This is where we define our elements. And we're going to have to dip our toe into some subatomic particles just a little bit to help us understand how these atoms can come together to form molecules. But we're, we're going to get into just a little bit of chemistry. Now, I am a biology professor because I sucked at chemistry. It was a little bit too much like math for me. So we're going to do a lot of description and not a whole lot of math. I hope that's okay. So a lot of times you see these symbols as illustrations of atoms. You have a lot of these structures orbiting outside in these sort of elliptical, spherical orbits like planets around the sun. You have this material in the middle, which we refer to as the atomic nucleus. So I think we're still, even at this point, fairly comfortable with what we think an atom looks like. So as we break that atom down, we're going to talk about three components. And these are the three important components that we're going to focus on for our understanding of how atoms can interact with one another and come together to form molecules. So we have electrons, protons, and neutrons. And as we look just to the right of each one of those terms, I put a minus, a plus, and a zero. What do you think my minus sign beside the electron means? The minus sign means the electron has a negative charge. What's the plus by proton? Positive charge. Now, I, you know I like simple stuff. And I like finding ways to remember things. I like the fact that proton begins with a P and positive begins with a P. That's easy, right? Why won't that work for the other two? Because I'm like negative N. Whew, maybe the negative one starts with an N as well. No, it doesn't work that way, does it? Neutron. What charge does it have? Neutral. So you, you've got to be careful by coming up with these mnemonics. Because if you think of negative neutron, you've got it backwards. So we have to think of neutron neutral, proton positive, and the electron, you're, you're just going to have to commit that to memory that that is the negatively charged subatomic particle. Okay? Now the other thing that's sort of neat, these two sort of follow positive P, neutral, neutron. Those terms being linked together, that, that's pretty good because they're both found in the atomic nucleus versus the one that the name doesn't align with its charge. That's the one that's orbiting around the atomic nucleus. And when you hear descriptions about atoms and subatomic particles and how they're placed together, you will hear electrons referred to as being placed around the atomic nucleus in orbits, orbitals, or something called electron shells. Have you ever heard them described that way? And a lot of times they are illustrated in these two-dimensional rings that you see orbiting around the nucleus. Now, that, that's a way that we can sort of easily try to understand electrons. But understand in a three-dimensional setting, these electrons are really orbiting around that atomic nucleus almost in every position at once. That's how they're moving. So it's more of a sphere more than a ring. Does that make sense? And as we package in more and more electrons, their physical space that they're going to occupy, sometimes it's almost going to look like a teardrop or an hourglass. We're not going to be so... Uh, taken with those shapes that it's going to be critical to know. But I just want you to understand it's not just these rings. 
You know, it's not like the ring of power or anything like that. It's three-dimensional actual physical space with which the electrons orbit. So again, sticking with our simplified look at electrons, conceptually we need to understand how electrons are organized around the atomic nucleus. Now, I think the thing that I didn't mention on the last slide, and maybe it wasn't there, so write this into your notes. The number of protons that are present in an atom for naturally occurring elements are going to equal the number of electrons that we have in a naturally occurring atom. The number of protons and the number of electrons are going to be equal. And so for a particular atom, they're, they're going to have a neutral charge. For those naturally occurring atoms, they're not going to have a positive, they're not going to have a negative, they're going to have no net charge associated with them. <coughs> now, we'll, we'll come back to that as it relates to our periodic table. But right now, let's look at our electrons. So as we look at the physical space around the atomic nucleus, for the first two electrons that we can package, we're going to put them in an orbit that is closest to the atomic nucleus. Two is the maximum number we can get into this first shell or this first orbital. Does that mean all atoms have at least two electrons? No. Hydrogen is our first. Hydrogen only has one electron. Therefore, hydrogen only has one electron in that first orbital. So since that first orbital can hold two, and hydrogen only has one, that means that first orbital is half full, right? And as we look at atoms, atoms want that outermost orbital. They want it filled with the maximum number of electrons that that will hold because that's the most stable condition for an atom. So hydrogen is going to be looking to fill that outer shell. And that's one region hydrogen forms molecules with other atoms so readily. We're going to find hydrogen all over the place associated with a ton of other atoms and other elements. So that's our first two electrons. But as we look at other elements such as carbon, nitrogen, um, sulfur, we're going to see that they have more than two. Well, if you can't package any more in that first shell, if you're going on a big trip and you've packed that one suitcase as full as it's going to get, and that's mostly the ladies. Guys, we don't pack nearly as much as the ladies, typically. you got to get another suitcase, right? So our first suitcase only holds two electrons. You've got to get another one. The next suitcase we have, the second orbital, and they're going to be concentric rings moving outward. So the second orbital... And all additional orbitals will only hold eight electrons. So you can't have a suitcase that holds 32. TSA is going to kick that right back. You're going to have to go back to the gate, and they're going to make you pay another $100 to put that big suitcase on the plane. So the first orbital, how many maximum? Two. What about the fourth orbital, what's the maximum? Eight. eight. What about the tenth? Eight. Second? Eight. Fifth? Eight. Okay, eight. You get the point. They're all eight. So let's say this. Okay, here, here is a question I can almost promise you is going to appear on the exam. A question like this one. Adam X Atom X has 14 protons. Atom X has 14 protons. How many electrons are in the outermost shell? Who's going to be the first answer? Eight. 
Is that the correct answer? No, that's not correct. Now, that outermost orbital can hold eight, but for our element X that has 14 electrons, how many are you going to find in the outermost shell? Four. Four. Now, a lot of other people thought eight, but you were the one brave enough to say it. But I'm glad you did because we make a point. You know, have you ever discovered that you learn more by getting something incorrect than necessarily by getting it correct? I will never forget when I was a student here in comparative anatomy, our final practical on the cat. They had pinned this big blue vein. I mean, it was huge. It was like a garden hose. I had never seen it before. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, did they just transplant this in here as a freak or something? I, I know I would have noticed this, but it was underneath the lungs. You had to lift the lungs to get to it to see it. It was called the azygous vein. It feeds the posterior dorsal part of the body. I didn't know it, but you see, even to this day, I remember the azygous vein. So don't be afraid to maybe not get something exactly correct because you'll learn from it in here. Where you really want to nail it down is when? Test day. Test day. So four is the number of electrons in the outermost shell. Let's calculate that out. We have 14. Where are the first two going to go? In the first shell. That knocks us down from 14 to 12. We have 12 electrons. How many more can we pack into the second orbital? Eight. eight. So you take eight from the 12. How many are left? Four. So that will be in our third orbital. The thing that people get in trouble with the most is forgetting those first two. That gets you in trouble the most. But if you remember the first and second totals, ten, then after that it's eight, 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 eight as you go. All right? So I can promise you. Now, if I tell you I'm going to put something on the test, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not. I'm telling you there will be a question on the exam September 18th that will ask you to tell me about electrons in an orbital. Now, in here, I may ask you a kahoot. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, because I told you to read the question, right? Okay, let's try this again. Who's going to be the first to answer? <laughs> There's always one, right? There's always one. So element Y has 17 protons. Element Y has 17 protons. In element Y, how many electrons will you find in the innermost shell? Two. Ooh, y'all are good. You saw what I did, right? What did I say? Innermost shell. Invariably, when I put that on a Kahoot, half the class misses it. Because you know what I do? I will put seven as the very first response. And what do they do? Seven. Boop. Oh, yeah. Got it. And then two comes up. It's like, uh-uh. You have to read the question. My stepsons love trying to trick me and to tell jokes. Here is my example of why you must read the question. If you know the answer, if you've heard this before, please let's let everybody else boil about this, okay? Answer this question for me. I saw it on the TV show Brain Games. You ever seen that thing pop up? <clears throat> it was on Brain Games. My television is over my fireplace mantle. I was actually standing at my television, arguing with the television until I realized I didn't read the question. Okay, so here we go. How many animals of each kind, how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark? Okay, how many animals, okay, I heard two, I heard one. The answer is zero. And, and when, when they said that on the television, I got offended. <laughs> I jumped up. I was like, dude, I went to Sunday school. That was two of each kind. But then he showed the written out question. How many animals of each kind did Moses take 
Uh, who took the animals? Noah. Yeah, so then they showed that. I was like, I just kind of sat back down. I'm like, man, I tell everybody to read the question, and I didn't. The other one my boys like. A passenger jet crashes on the border of the United States and Canada. The plane crashes on the border of the United States and Canada. Where do you bury the survivors? Where do you bury them? You don't bury survivors. Again, read the question. All right? So, shells, atomic nucleus, you are going to see those on the test. Now, as we talk about elements and atoms, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, those are four of the biggies that we're going to need to pay attention to as well as sodium and potassium. We've already talked about those. But you're going to look at a periodic chart and you're going to see information. You're going to see a symbol. You're going to see the name written out. It's going to be important to know these, especially for those six or so that we're really going to use all the time. But you're also going to see an atomic number. Atomic number for carbon is six. So for carbon, how many electrons do you have? Six, because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. Now, for, for me personally, the much less meaningful information is atomic mass, but that's protons and neutrons. And again, typically, for naturally occurring elements, those are going to be the same as well. You can't have some isotopes, radioactive isotopes, that protons and neutrons differ in their number. We're not going <coughs> to... We're not going to play with those a lot in this class. Now, I am 52 years old. I have been doing biology for the majority of my life. But this is the first time that I have taught Bio 238. And as I'm preparing for the lectures, and I, I pull this image up out of the textbook, I look at that and I go, oh, I never realized that. I knew how it was organized. I've had to memorize it before, even back in middle school and high school. But I never realized it was arranged such that the first row on the left are elements that have an outermost shell with only one electron. In the second row, the outermost shell has only two electrons. And as we get over, we have to skip all these in the middle, but when we get to this row, they have three. Here we have carbon, outermost shell of four, nitrogen and phosphorus, outermost shell of five, oxygen and sulfur six, chloride seven. I never realized that they were arranged by electrons in the outermost shell. And I was just like, if I had only known this all these years, how helpful that would be. But when we talk about electrons in the outermost shell, those are referred to as valence electrons. These are the electrons that can be used to interact with other atoms to form molecules. Because what did I say, and this is sort of anthro anthropomorphic, but atoms want that outermost shell to be in what condition? Full. They want it to be full. That's the most stable condition. And if it's not full, then they're going to seek out ways and interactions with other atoms to try to fill that outermost shell. There's only one row that has an outermost shell that is full. And these are called the noble gases, but they're also called inert gases. Why do you think they're called inert? They don't form molecules with anybody else. They're stuck up. They're like, eh, we're just sticking with it. We're good. We're good by ourselves. And we talked about the electrons and how we package them. So element with a atomic number of 12. How many electrons are going to be in the first orbital? Two. Two. 
We've, we've nailed that down, right? Are you ever going to pack three into that first orbital? No. no. You've got to account for those first two. Now, here's a little different way of asking that question. For sodium, how many electrons are in the outermost shell? Whoa, now that's a different way to ask you that question. Because that's going to be imperative on you that you know what the atomic number is of sodium. And that's a bit of information you're going to need to know. So with sodium, how many electrons are in the outermost shell? You have to have memorized that atomic number, or at least you've had to remember the position of sodium in the periodic table. So looking at our periodic chart, finding sodium and the symbol for sodium, how many electrons are in the outermost orbital? Several different answers. And the easiest way for us to determine that is by the column that you find our element in. Sodium and the symbol for sodium being Na. Sodium is in the most left-hand column. That represents that number one. What, what, what is the official definition of that number one for that first column? Sorry? The valence electrons. Remember, valence electrons are the number of electrons in the outermost orbital. So if you remember the chart, and specifically the elements that we have colored in, those are going to be the ones that are for biological systems and organic molecules. These are the ones that are going to be most important for us to remember as we go through anatomy, physiology, and we move into biochemistry. So if you remember their position in the chart and associate with their valence electrons, that's going to make it much easier. Now with two weeks to go for the exam, you should already have begun to organize your information, outline your notes, Create your mnemonics in ways that you can remember the information. Now, a lot of people make flashcards. I'm not going to call you out if you're making flashcards. I am not a big flashcard fan because I'm lazy. And making flashcards takes a lot of what? It takes a lot of time and a lot of flashcards. But the other reason I don't like flashcards is if you have flashcards... What do you typically do, can I borrow this, with a flashcard? Let's say this is your flashcard, right? What do you put on one side? Uh, the definition. On one side, what goes on the other? The answer, the term. So we've got valence electrons on one side, other side, number of electrons in the outermost orbital, right? So when you're studying with the flashcards in your hand, you see valence electrons. Okay, electrons. I know that has to do with electrons, right? Because it's in the word. Is it the total number of electrons? Is it the electrons that are closest? Oh, man, I know this one. Valence electrons, they're, um... oh, yeah. It... You know what I'm talking about? You cheat, you bunch of cheaters. When typically is the first time you are asked the question that you don't have the card in your hand during the test. And you see that question, what are valence electrons, and you start shaking because you want that card. And you want to be able to look, but you can't remember. How many of you have ever been part of a team, part of a sport, part of a group, band, cheer, anybody? How many of you have been part of a group? Okay. How many of you have ever been a part of a group and you never practiced? Oh, we got, we got one over here. How did that go? Did that go pretty well for you for the performance? or Okay. <laughs> After class, you got to tell me what that was. I want to know. Typically, if you don't practice, you're going to show up, especially if it's a Friday night, and the results probably aren't going to be 
all that great, right? I think the lumberjacks practiced, even though Saturday might not have looked like it. <laughs> that, was, that was painful. That was, that was painful. That was my first game to broadcast lumberjack football in the booth, and it was painful. <laughs> they may not ask me back if they think I'm a bad luck charm. But you're going to practice, and that's going to be reflected on how you perform. You don't practice for football by going on a basketball court and shooting free throws, right? That's not going to help you on a football field. So if you can't have anything with you for the test, how should you be studying? You should end up at the end of your studies and the end of your preparation knowing the information without having any sort of crutch. If all you do is read the book, and the first time you don't have that book with you is during the test, it's not going to work. So let's just take an example. This is how I prepared for exams. This is how I've talked with students for 15 years about preparing for exams. It's a strategy that works for many. It's not going to work for everyone. Everyone has their own unique way, and you have to find that sooner than later. <clears throat> but when you look at the periodic chart... And you feel like, okay, I have to memorize that thing. Does anyone else other than me start getting nervous? That's a lot of information, isn't it? You have to decide, okay, what is the most important stuff that I have to remember from this set of data? What am I going to remember for that exam so I can increase my chances of getting the questions right? So if we had to... Minimize information. What are we going to minimize first? Or what are we going to say, okay, these are the most important things? What stands out? I mean, literally stands out. The stuff in color. So I tell you what, let's get rid of everything not in color. That's better, right? You don't feel as anxious when you go, okay, I've got two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven blocks I've got to remember and six numbers. But that's still pretty busy, right? It's still kind of busy. I think I can make it even simpler. So as I'm looking at that, it's like, you know, I have to remember what valence goes with which element. I immediately go, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make little mnemonics. So I'm going to remember one is NAC. We're in NAC. It's spelled different. You've got to remember the symbols, right? Na is who? Sodium. H, hydrogen. K is the tricky one. Potassium. So one knack. <clears throat> so back to my question. How many electrons are in the outermost orbital of sodium? One. See how easy that is now? Boom. You, got, you didn't have to look back. You've already got it. Number two. Cam G. Cam G. What's C A? M G. Magnesium. Two. Cam G. And when you do something silly, you're going to remember the silly stuff, right? When we get to muscle contraction, oh, we got some silly stuff. But let me tell you, I have had medical students tell me that when they get to medical school, and they're working with muscle and muscle contraction, they do the same silly little thing in their med school class that we did in here. You remember silly. So you're going to remember two, cam, g. We don't have a three, right? Four. What's C? Now, you notice I turned it around. I think it's easier for me to remember C4. That's rather explosive. C4. That's a good one. Five, most of you are pre-nursing, so what's NP to you? Nurse practitioner, five NP. Six, so. What's S? Sulfur, O, oxygen. You see how easy this is? You don't have to make this stuff hard. The simpler you make it, the better you organize it, the more you're going to remember it. Seven. CL. What's CL? Chlorine. And that's it. That's all you have to remember. And you've got those biologically important, 
organically responsible atoms that we're going to use to build our macromolecules. And this is also going to help with our understanding of electrons since we put the numbers in there as well. So do you see what I've done? I've organized the information in a meaningful way and at the same time, I've minimized what I have to remember. Because you're not memorizing a whole periodic table. Now, you're memorizing, what do we have up there? Less than 25 letters and numbers? These are the cues and the clues that are going to help you pull the information from out of here. That's what you memorize. Because you already understand valence electrons, you understand their significance, you understand the names of these elements anyway. This is just your cue card, your cheat notes that you're going to use. And where are your cheat notes going to be come two weeks on test day? Right here. Did you say in your back pocket? Is that what you just said? <laughs> We're going to frisk you down when you come in here, baseball man. Yes, ma'am. Not mass. No, no, no. Not, not mass. That's, that's neutrons. That's with neutrons as well. Right now for A and P1, we're just wanting to loan valence. Okay? No. Because atomic number really is not as significant to us. Why are the valence electrons significant to us? Chemical bonds. You let me right there, man. I need to pay you off. That was a good segue. Oh. Those valence electrons are what we need to know for forming our chemical bonds, our bonding of the atoms together. Without understanding about those valence electrons, we wouldn't know if we could form molecules or not. And remember, molecules, two or more atoms tied together. Now, this looks as if Molecules are just more than one atom of the same element. That's not entirely true. Because you can have molecules that are two or more atoms that have different elements associated with them, like water, for instance. But in that case, a better term is compound. A compound more than two or more atoms of different elements. So here's, here's one of these some and all sort of statements. All compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Does that make, does that make sense? It depends on if you're all the same or if you have different elements. But what determines if we can form molecules or compounds, are those valence electrons. And when we look at bonding these together, there are three principal ways that we can interconnect atoms. The three principal types of bonds are going to be ionic, covalent, and the last is hydrogen. Now that last one's kind of tricky. It's not going to be hydrogen acting like glue, but we'll, we'll get to that in the very end. So what's going to be important as we go through our types of bonds? Number one, know the mechanisms through which the bonds are formed. And these have a lot to do with those valence electrons. The other thing that I want you to pay attention to with these bonds is the strength of the bond. We're going to have one that's really, really, really strong. We're going to have one that's fairly weak. And we got one that's just right in the middle. The strength of the bond. That's going to be biologically critical for what we have to do and how we build up our molecules and how biological systems can adjust and modify and manipulate those molecules down the road. So let's start with our first one, ionic. I mean, these are taking us, you know, really no significant order. So 
So as we start with ionic bonding, I'm going to go back and ask my question again. How many electrons are in the outermost shell of sodium? One. Remember NAC. One NAC. That will clue you in. You can get that information. So there's one electron in the outermost shell of sodium. Now for atoms, we said they are most stable under what conditions for that outermost shell? When it's filled. So sodium has a couple of options to fill that outermost shell. If you want to load up more electrons, you've got to have seven. And that's going to cost you a lot on eBay. What is another tricky way that sodium could have a full outermost shell? We're, we're getting to that one. Hmm? Get rid of one. Sell that last one on eBay. Now you drop down to that next shell that has eight. Now you've got a full outermost shell. So... Sodium wants to get rid of that electron. And so sodium is often considered an electron donor. It gives away an electron. But now we have a problem. Because with sodium, and we said sodium, I don't know if we can play this game or not. Yeah, we can play this game. Can anyone tell me what the atomic number of sodium is? 11. Because we got that one in the outermost shell, which means we have 8 and 2. So that's 11. So sodium has an atomic number of 11. When it donates that electron, what is its atomic number? It's still 11 because it's number of protons. And we said for naturally occurring atoms, it's always the same, but this has not been a naturally occurring thing when you give away an electron. So now we still have 11 protons, but how many electrons do we have left? 10. Now when we have 11 protons and 11 neutrons, we said their charges did what? Canceled each other out. Now with 11 protons and 10 electrons, what's happening with our overall net charge now? It's, pos it's more positive than negative. So whenever sodium gives away an electron and the resulting atom has a positive charge, we no longer call it an atom per se, we call it an ion. It is now an ion with a positive charge, and technically you could refer to it as a cation. Now, sodium, sodium is not stupid. Electrons are not cheap. And so sodium is not just going to throw that electron in the garbage. Sodium is going to put that thing on Amazon. So... When you look at an atom that's selling an electron, who do you think is the most likely person that's going to pay the most for? Yeah. Someone with seven electrons because they only need how many more to complete that outermost shell? One. They only need the one. And so when we look at our periodic chart, right, how many elements do we have in our periodic chart that need one more? Chloride, remember? 7Cl. So chloride having 7 in its outermost shell, which is going to be easier, pick up one or sell the 7? Pick up one. So chloride is an electron acceptor. And so sodium gets on eBay. I got an electron to sell. Chloride goes, man, I've been looking for that electron. I'll, I'll take it. So sodium 
sells chloride, that electron, they both have full outermost shells. And they are both ions now. Sodium, a cation with a positive charge. Chloride, an anion with a negative charge. But we haven't made a molecule yet, have we? No, we've just created two ions. I think it's at this point we introduce oxytocin. And what did we say oxytocin? What kind of hormone was oxytocin? Oxytocin is the love hormone. Did you know that? We talked about oxytocin with the uterine contractions. Physical contact, <coughs> affection, increases the expression of oxytocin in your body and it gives you those butterflies and that love feeling. So now we have two ions with opposite charges and what do opposites do? Oh, I think we've got some music playing in the background because sodium says, hey, you know, it's kind of nice when I met you and gave you that electron. You want to share Snapchat? Start texting each other. Next thing you know, you're hanging out all the time together. That kind of bond, the attractive forces between two oppositely charged ions, that's the ionic bond. And the strength of that bond is intermediate as far as our three bonding types. It's not that weak, it's not that strong. So we can think of the ionic bond as, okay, we're exclusively dating. We stick together most of the time. But these bonds can be broken. They're not so strong that they can't be broken. And in fact, when you look at this bond, simply because one ion is positive and one ion is negative, there are some pretty easy ways that you can dissolve that relationship. And in fact, many of you have done this experiment in your kitchen many times. Yeah, what's sodium chloride? Salt. salt, table salt. You put salt in water and what happens to the salt? It dissolves. It doesn't just get smaller. The salt actually ionizes. The sodium and chloride dissociate from one another. Because water is charged. And water is going to come between and surround the sodium and surround the chloride. Well, let's look at water. How, how does water do its thing? The two hydrogens in the oxygen of water, they're going to form a compound via what are referred to as covalent bonding. Covalent bonds happen because of shared electrons. You're going to have atoms that go, hey, man, let me borrow your electrons. And the other one's going to go, uh-uh, I need to borrow your electrons. Well, okay, let's do rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first. No, let's do it at the same time. So they share. And if these atoms share equally, then that compound or molecule is referred to as a nonpolar molecule. But if there's an unequal sharing, which we see with water, that results in a polarized molecule, that part of the molecule is going to be more positive and another part of the molecule is going to be more negative. So let's look first. Let's look first at our polar. Now, salt, that results from ions forming. We're not going to ionize anything here. Ionic bonding, remember, is donating or receiving an electron resulting in an ionic charge that attracts. Here, we're not going to have charged atoms per se. The atom itself isn't going to be charged. And when we look at our equal sharing of electrons, such as we have with hydrogen, how many, how many electrons does each hydrogen need to complete its orbital? It needs one. And so the two hydrogens get together. These are the twins. They go, hey, let me borrow your electron. No, man, I need one. Let me borrow yours. No, let's arm wrestle. Let's just share. 
And so when they equally share electrons, each atomic nucleus has two electrons orbiting around the atomic nucleus the same amount of time for both. So both have full orbitals for the same amount of time. This is a nonpolar molecule that has no net charge at all. You could say the same thing for O2, the oxygen in our atmosphere, equally shared electrons. Now this next situation with our polar, this is like big brother and big sister. Okay, how many big brothers or big sisters do we have? Okay, how many little brothers, little sisters do we have? Okay, I hope this doesn't start a fight, but we'll try. So in the case of water, oxygen is big brother, big sister. You got the two little brothers, two little sisters that are hydrogens. Oxygen has a valence of what? Okay, let's, let's think about it. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in the outermost shell. So how many more we need? We need two more. We need two more. With our two hydrogens, that's the two more electrons we need. So we're like, hey, let me have your electron. But, you know, little brothers, they're not so little anymore. They're going to fall for it too often. So the big brother goes, okay, the only way I'm going to get those electrons if I say let's share the electrons. And so oxygen convinces the two little hydrogens to share the electrons. It says, yeah, I'll let you use one of mine some, but you let me use one of yours some. That way you'll have two and I'll complete my eight. But what, what does Big Brother usually do when Big Brother says he's going to share? Does he really share? No, nah, he keeps it most of the time. And so oxygen is going to keep those electrons around its atomic nucleus far more than it allows the two electrons to go out to the hydrogens. And so that's going to result in a slight negative charge around the oxygen and slight positive charges around the hydrogens. We haven't created ions. You see how that's different? They're not permanent ions, but because of the movement of the shared electrons, you create a slight charge difference. And so we say that this molecule is a polar molecule. Now, have you ever had to work with polarized stuff before? Yeah, I had to work with one yesterday. I sat down in my TV, Went to switch the television from Netflix to football, and the remote wasn't working. And as a guy, I started to panic, because that remote's got to work. Well, then I discovered that there were no batteries in the remote. Well, at that point, I knew that the batteries had gone out on the Xbox controller, and my boys had just needed batteries, and that's where they get their batteries from. So I got two new batteries, put them in, and the remote still didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, I, they were brand new batteries. I put them in backwards. You ever done that? You got to take them out, shift them around. To, why does it matter which way you put batteries into a remote? There's a positive end and a negative end of the battery. The battery is polarized. Just like a battery is polarized, these resulting molecules that unequally share electrons are polarized. So when you put sodium chloride in water, ions have a charge and they attract each other because of that charge difference. When you put them in water, okay, sodium and chloride start to have conversations like, you haven't texted me in two days. You've, you've not included me in your Facebook status for a week. So they break up. And as soon as sodium and chloride break up, now you've got sodium with what kind of charge? Positive. Chloride with what charge? Negative. Water forms a sphere of hydration around them. Because this negative 
is attracted to the positive sodium. These positives are attracted to the negative chloride. So you create what are called spheres of hydration. That's how you dissolve salt in water. The same thing happens with people, right? When two people break up, all the girlfriends surround the one girl, the guy goes, hangs out with all his guys, you know, it's the same thing. So that's how the polarized state of water can dissolve salt. And in fact, water is called the universal solvent. It dissolves most any type of polarized or ionic molecule. So ionic bonding was the intermediate strength bond. Covalent bonding is the cement that holds atoms together. Our third type of bond is going to be our weakest. And our third type of bond is referred to as hydrogen bond. And our example is going to be water. Because when you look at water, you don't see individual water molecules floating around independent of anything else. Water molecules like to stick together. You ever been, whack, you wax your car and it comes that first rain and you see a water drop coming down the hood of your car and it gets close to another drop? What, what happens to those two drops as they get close together? You see them kind of suck together, it's like magnets. Well, the reason that happens is because of these slight negative charge, uh, slight positive charges and slight negative charges. Yeah, they create these weak bonds based on charge difference that's referred to as a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are the weakest, and they're some of the most important in biological systems because they can be fairly easily broken. Have you ever done an experiment where you broke hydrogen bonds? Everybody say yeah. If you've boiled water, you've broken hydrogen bonds. Because the liquid state of water, those hydrogen bonds holding water together in one place, can easily be broken when you apply energy. And when you boil water, you're supplying energy in the form of heat. And so when you get to 100 degrees centigrade or 212 Fahrenheit, you turn water into what? Steam. Steam expands. Steam takes up a greater volume because the water molecules break those hydrogen bonds and the water molecules spread out. That's how you can break hydrogen bonds fairly easily. Every cell in your body at critical time periods must break hydrogen bonds. If those don't get broken, you can't grow, you can't heal wounds, because hydrogen bonds are also critical for holding your two strands of DNA together. Now, in each one of your cells, you have this double-stranded DNA molecule, your genetic code that encodes for anything and everything you do, how you look, many instances how you behave and for that one cell to divide you have to make additional strands of DNA that two stranded DNA molecule must separate so that each strand can be used as a template with which to make two new strands that each daughter cell is going to receive and when you look at how the strands are held together, we have our base pairs. You may have heard this from some biology class. You have our base pairs that come together. Go ahead and start right now remembering A, T, C, G. Those are the pairings together. And when you look in between our two bases of our two DNA strands, what holds the bases together? Hydrogen bonds. And so you have enzymes that very easily, when it comes time for DNA to replicate, enzyme slides down that strand and it unzips those hydrogen bonds because it is the weakest of our, of our bonds. If they were held together with covalent bonds, you would never get them apart. It would take too much energy. 
So that's why even we talk about a weak bond, it's still critical. So covalent bonds, I look at that like cement, super glue. Ionic bonds and intermediate, intermediate strength, maybe like Elmer's glue. You can, you know, you get that stuff wet or it's going to break whenever you need it not to, right? Hydrogen bonds, I look at that like Velcro. Because Velcro, it'll, it'll hold together, but you can take it apart, put it back, right? So hydrogen bonds are Velcro. That's how I think of the bonding that results when we take these molecules polar molecules and have them hold together. Now with all of our chemical bonds, as we start to make molecules and larger and larger molecules for that matter, we're going to talk about our biologically important macromolecules. We can have settings much like we do with water. We can refer to this as a polar molecule because it's held together with these polar covalent bonds. Now, what's the mechanism for covalent bonds relative to the electrons? Yeah, it holds it together. But remember, ionic bonds were formed because you gave or you donated an electron. With covalent, we share. Shared electrons is covalent bond. Giving or receiving is an ionic bond. So when we unequally share electrons, we end up with a polarized molecule like water. But we can also have covalent bonds that are shared equally in which you have no net charge. And so we call those nonpolar molecules. I know we looked at H2. But here we have a hydrocarbon, two carbons together with hydrogen surrounding them. When we refer to hydrocarbons, oftentimes we're thinking of some organic solution like gasoline or diesel, or we can think of gases, butane, methane. So when we talk about these hydrocarbons, we often refer to them as the term aliphatic, but a term that I like to use more, kind of a synonym, is hydrophobic. What does the word hydro mean? Water. And phobic? Fearing. So hydrophobic. That means if we have polar molecules, they are going to not necessarily fear water. They're not going to interact with water. Oil is a hydrocarbon. Oil is aliphatic. Oil is hydrophobic. And you already know this because oil and water don't mix. They don't interact. So again, as we're assembling these macromolecules, our understanding of chemistry and those chemical bonds, it's not that I'm just trying to find stuff to put on the test. No, it's significant to how we form these biological macromolecules that we're going to assemble into organelles, that we're going to assemble into plasma membranes, and how we are going to undergo the physiology of all of our organs and organ systems. It really all comes down to what we're talking about now. This is the foundation we're going to build on as we get to those systems, and it's why it's so important to understand them, not just memorize numbers and abbreviations, but understand how they're put together. Now, we also have molecules that it's a conglomeration of both. And these are called amphipathic. We've probably all heard of an amphibian, right? What is, where does an amphibian live? Water or land. Different parts of their life cycle, they will live in different habitats. So an amphipathic molecule means it is a molecule where part of it is polar, but another part of it is nonpolar. And our example that we have on the screen is one that we're going to see later in this chapter. This is referred to as a phospholipid molecule that is a principal component of all of your membranes. Your plasma membrane, your nuclear membrane, 
your mitochondrial membrane, the Golgi membrane, the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, the principal component are going to be phospholipids. And the phospholipid is amphipathic because you have a part, which is kind of this rounded part, that is referred to as a polar head. It is a conglomeration of atoms that result in it having a slight charge. So there's unequal sharing of electrons at some part of that polarized head of the molecule. And extending away from that polarized head, we have two long hydrocarbon chains. Hydrocarbons, remember, we said are nonpolar. So that's the nonpolar portion of this amphipathic molecule. We call them fatty acid chains, and it's actually going to create, when we look at our plasma membrane, it's going to create a situation where you have a hydrophobic lining of your plasma membrane, and on the outside, and because of another layer of phospholipids on the inside, you have polarized groups that can cause this entire package we call the cell to basically be water soluble and be able to interact with water. Which is a good thing, right? Because our body is mostly what? Water. Our cells have to be able to interact with and live in an aqueous environment. I'm not talking about like Aquaman, but you know, we have to be able to interact with water.